Hi friends, uh, my name is Fadi and I'm an endocrinologist and a biochemical geneticist from the NIH. And uh, how many of you have been to the NIH for various reasons? Okay, so the majority of you have not. Are you aware that there are protocols dedicated for Erdine Chester disease at the National Institute of Health? So that's something you could certainly benefit from. The NIH is the largest uh, research-based institute in the world that offers free uh, healthcare delivery all under research protocols. Uh, we also offer standards of care testing, clinical testing of various sorts. We're particularly concerned with the endocrine manifestations of various diseases, including Erdan Chester disease, and we invite you to consider coming to the NIH for your endocrine needs and evaluation. So I'm gonna provide my contact info at the end of the slides, and I'll be more than happy to answer any concerns related to your hormone needs at any time. Please feel free to email me, and I'll also be able to uh, help you find a hormone specialist near you. I recognize that endocrinologists are not well dispersed across North America. There are a lot of regions that lack a hormone specialist, um, but we're here to help you, all right? So the focus of my talk is to review some common endocrine dysfunctions in ECD. Obviously, there's a long laundry list of endocrine dysfunction that I'm not gonna be able to cover in 20 minutes, but those highlighted in red are the major comorbidities that I'm gonna try to cover. More importantly, I'd like to help answer your questions at the end of the talk, so I'm gonna save some time for that. So some of the objectives are what hormones are affected, what specific hormones are affected, what's, what are the common symptoms that patients with various endocrine dysfunctions present with, um, what are uh, the hormone deficiencies, how are they treated, when should you seek an endocrinologic evaluation, and what blood tests are commonly ordered. Please make note of this website. It's called the Hormone Health Network. Uh, the website is hormone.org. Uh, this is your go-to friendly website to help answer your questions related to the endocrine system. Um, it is uh, free of charge, um, offered by the Endocrine Society, which is the <coughs> biggest endocrine body in the world. Um, and offers an annual um, meeting that's coming up in New Orleans end of March, if you're interested in, in visiting or if you'll be in that area. Very helpful uh, to help answer your endocrine needs. It also has a free app, um, and this app is very helpful to provide an overview of what endocrinology is, what various endocrine dysfunctions exist, it does not talk about ECD per se, but any endocrine dysfunction can be found here. If you go to the U and Tour endocrinology section, there is a sub-tab that can help you find an endocrinologist near you. And if you have any particular questions related to endocrinology, these folks are very quick at answering your questions or directing you to an endocrinologist that will help answer your questions. So, ECD affects multiple organs. It affects almost every endocrine organ in the body. Shown here is the pituitary gland, connected via a stop to the hypothalamus. This is a commonly affected region in the brain. The pituitary gland is the body's conductor of the hormone system. So any inflammation of that region will lead to a dysregulated hormonal system that affects almost every organ or endocrine organ in the body. So if this is affected by inflammation, more likely that the individual will face multiple hormonal abnormalities. Therefore, it is crucial to receive a comprehensive hormonal evaluation to ensure that those hormones are either normal or abnormal. This is what a typical pituitary 
gland looks like in a patient with ECD affected uh, by pituitary dysfunction. Um, shown here is the pituitary gland. In this particular instance, there's thickening of this region because of an inflammatory response. As you can appreciate, this region uh, is very small in volume, so any inflammation can lead to major destruction or abnormality. And that major destruction and abnormality can lead to significant hormonal derangement. Here's another example of a inflamed pituitary gland. The pituitary gland sits in an area of the brain called the cella, and the area above the cella is referred to as the supracellar region. That whole region can be affected by ECD. One of the most common hormonal abnormalities in patients with ECD is diabetes insipidus. It's, it refers to an imbalance of water in the body. Patients present with intense thirst, something we refer to in the medical literature as polydipsia. The second most common abnormality is excessive excretion of urine something we refer to as polyuria. Typically, patients with diabetes insipidus pee out more than three to four liters per day of dilute water. So the water does not, or the urine does not look concentrated or yellow. It looks clear because they do not have the ability to retain water from the kidneys because of a deficiency of a hormone called vasopressin that's secreted by that area I was referring to, the cellar area, the pituitary area. So the two most common symptoms are excessive thirst, requiring a lot of water intake, excessive peeing to more than three to four liters per day. All right? There are various forms of diabetes insipidus that the endocrinologist can help pinpoint the cause of the diabetes insipidus. The most common cause in patients with ECD is referred to as central DI or central diabetes insipidus, which refers to an abnormality in the brain. So approximately 50%, if not more, of patients with ECD have diabetes insipidus in one form or, or the other. The symptoms vary. And the treatment is rather easy if the correct diagnosis is made. The correct diagnosis requires a specialized test called the water deprivation test. Have you heard of this test before? I had. Perfect. It's a dangerous test to perform, right? <laughs> Terrible test. So please make sure that this test is done under expertise guidance because things can go wrong if not done appropriately. This test should be done under supervision either by a nephrologist or an endocrinologist or an experienced internist. And it entails fasting overnight, being admitted to the uh, testing unit, and then checking blood work regularly to see if the sodium and the water regulation in the body is abnormal. And then to see the effect of administering vasopressin, a medication that's called desmopressin, will have any effect on this water imbalance. This is the gold standard test to diagnose diabetes insipidus. If you were told that you have diabetes insipidus without ascertaining the diagnosis with this test, there might be a possibility that you do not have diabetes insipidus. Therefore, it is recommended that you see someone specialized in performing this test to ascertain this diagnosis. The reason why it's critical to make this diagnosis is because if someone receives treatment, desmopressin, without having diabetes insipidus, they can get into major problems. Desmopressin is not a safe drug in normal people. 
It's a crucial drug in patients with diabetes insipidus. So make sure that right diagnosis is made. So a deficiency of pituitary hormones is referred to as pan or partial hypopituitarism. And several hormones can be affected, and there's a laundry of symptoms that could be included, which are really nonspecific. So fatigue, weight loss or weight gain, decreased sex drive or libido, decreased appetite, anemia, infertility, hot flashes. A lot of these symptoms can also be seen in the perimenopausal period or in the postmenopausal period. They could also be seen in patients with EC ECD that do not have endocrine dysfunction. They could be seen in patients with sleep apnea, particularly fatigue and daytime somnolence. And there are other conditions that may coexist with ECD or with endocrine dysfunction that could uh, you know, present with these <coughs> symptoms. So the take home point is that a lot of the endocrine manifestations and symptoms are nonspecific. Therefore, in order to make an endocrine diagnosis, the physician has to combine the signs, the symptoms, the blood work abnormalities, and specialized testings, such as the water deprivation test, to come up with a diagnosis. Once the diagnosis is ascertained, then treatment is offered. Treatment should not be offered <coughs> before a diagnosis is either considered or entertained or ascertained. The next issue I want to talk about is thyroid disease, which is prevalent in patients with ECD. And there are various forms of thyroid <coughs> diseases that may exist. The most prevalent cause of thyroid disease in patients with ECD is, is primary hypothyroidism, which is a dysfunction of the thyroid gland that sits right below the Adam's apple. This is a common problem in the population, in the general population. Approximately 4% of people have low thyroid state or hypothyroidism. But interestingly, people with ECD are likely five to eight times more likely to develop hypothyroidism than the general population. Screening for this test is simple. All you need to do is get a yearly TSH test. Have you heard of the TSH test before? Yeah. Thyroid stimulating hormone, very commonly tested in the general population. It's a good screening test. However, patients with ECD deserve a broader thyroid function test. That would also entail free thyroxine concentration, total thyroxine, and TPO antibodies. These are highly specialized biochemical tests that an endocrinologist can help with. Therefore, a patient with EC e ECD should not only receive TSH testing alone, all right? And that's something you can discuss with your care providers. We're going to publish this information shortly. And once it's available online, you could share this information with your healthcare provider so they could expand on testing for thyroid disease per se. So, who <coughs> recognizes this person right here? <laughs> the famous JFK. What endocrine problem did JFK have? Addison's. Yes, and you could appreciate that from his skin color. So interestingly, we have to make an important distinction between Addison's disease and primary adrenal insufficiency or adrenal insufficiency related to ECD. Addison's disease should only be used as a nomenclature in individuals who have adrenal problem related to an autoimmune condition. That was the condition that uh, JFK had. In patients with ECD, they do not have Addison's disease. They have <coughs> adrenal dysfunction related to the inflammatory response, which is the, the mechanism 
uh, or, the, or the bad pathology seen in ECD. The most common pathology in the adrenal gland is inflammation around the adrenal glands, sort of called the perinephric inflammation that surrounds the kidneys. And because the adrenal glands sit on top of the kidneys, that inflammation sort of surrounds and engulfs the adrenal gland, which is responsible for the production of a very important hormone called cortisol. But this inflammation can also happen in the pituitary gland, and the pituitary gland is responsible for sending signals to the adrenal glands to produce cortisol. So if that signal is defective, the adrenal gland won't be able to produce cortisol. So there could be two areas of the body that could lead to cortisol deficiency or adrenal insufficiency. Now what happens if someone has adrenal insufficiency? Well, they need to take steroids. Taking excess steroids can lead to major health consequences. Has anyone been on steroids before? So you know the feeling of being on high doses of steroids. Patients who are on high doses of steroids for a long time will develop these complications. They will develop thinning of the bone and osteoporosis. They will develop easy bruising, obesity, stretch marks in the abdomen referred to as stray. They will develop rounding of the face, high blood pressure, a buffalo hump. Those signs and symptoms are referred to as a cushionoid appearance. Now, in order to, pro to avoid complications related to excess steroids, it is important that every individual irrespective of their ECD status, that are on long-term steroids, should receive patient education on adrenal crisis. Of those that had or are or were treated with steroids, <coughs> did you hear of any patient-related information related to adrenal crisis? No. Raise your hand if you have. It's a very common problem. This is referred to as sick day or emergency education to avoid adrenal crisis. And I want, I, want, I want you to refer to this website that provides important and valuable tools for sick day and emergency rules in caring for individuals on high dose steroids. And let me summarize them for you. Everybody that receives high dose of steroids, prednisone doses of over 10, 15, 20 milligrams a day, as an example, should receive a medical alert bracelet that says adrenal insufficiency, and should receive a stress dose kit. This is covered by most insurances, it's provided for free at the NIH. And it entails an injectable kit of hydrocortisone, extra doses of prednisone or hydrocortisone, and a sheet that outlines when to use these extra doses at times of emergency or crisis. For example, if the patient receives 10 milligrams a day of prednisone for six months, and if they fall ill, they're in the hospital or if they develop pneumonia, they should triple their prednisone dose to 30 milligrams a day. Why? To prevent something called adrenal crisis, which could be deadly. Adrenal crisis can manifest with low blood pressure, shock, fatigue, electrolyte abnormalities, and death if not treated early. So the key point here is to understand that steroids are not safe and that high-dose steroids over the long run can cause to major problems. But if there are no alternative solutions, you will need to equip yourself with the right knowledge and the tools to prevent any crisis from being on high-dose steroids, particularly in times of need. So the golden question is, when should I seek an endocrinologist to test or treat the various hormonal deficiencies associated with ECD? 
Well, preferably at all times if possible. We invite you to come to the NIH uh, for a comprehensive endocrine evaluation. Uh, we invite you to seek endocrine related consultation and blood work testing on a yearly basis, uh, preferably by an endocrinologist, but other subspecialists can provide such testing as well, including internists or physicians alike. These are some important um, endocrine-related uh, websites that can provide help to you at times of need. The Endocrine Society, endocrine.org, is the largest endocrine body in the United States. The Hormone Health Network that offers free hormonal uh, consultations. Um, they can refer you to an endocrinologist uh, in your area um, and has other valuable tools. Mayo Clinic has a great patient-related information uh, uh, website uh, for various endocrine uh, issues. Um, and finally, my email address is here. Please uh, uh, email me with any endocrine-related questions that you have. Um, the NIH offers uh, great expertise in dealing with endocrine and non-endocrine-related uh, issues, and we'll be happy to assess your endocrine needs at the NIH. Uh, whenever you're in the area. So thank you, happy to answer your questions and concerns. I know there may be a lot regarding the endocrine related issues. Um, if uh, I could help answer some of those right now, I'll be more than happy to if we have some time. Good question. Um, the first difficulty is that patients should fast for long hours. So they need to start their fast overnight and then perform fasting under supervision during the day. Um, this, the most important difficulty is in tr the body trying to regulate the salt and water uh, concentrations at times of, of fasting. In a normal individual, that's possible because the body has hormonal regulations uh, that will prevent any major abnormalities from occurring. In patients with diabetes insipidus, they can get fluctuations in their sodium values very quickly uh, during a fast because of the lack of a hormone called vasopressin. And major fluctuations in sodium or electrolytes can lead to major problems, including death. Therefore, this has to be done under um, expertise supervision and in, an, in a medical area that could counter any possible de deleterious effects of the test. Yes? Right, so, uh, so I think the misconception in our communities is to drink large volumes of water to stay healthy. And the human body really only requires about two liters of water per day. Now people try to drink over three to four liters, sometimes five to six to try to stay healthy, uh, but that's really not recommended because your body does not need large volumes of water to stay healthy. Um, so. I do not know what your personal circumstances in terms of how much volume you're taking, how much uh, urine you're putting out. I'll be more than happy to discuss that as a side note, but really you should limit your water intake to the normal physiological levels to prevent any major problems from happening, particularly in the context of ECD, where there's a 50% likelihood that, it, that individuals with ECD have diabetes insipidus in one form or the other. Would uh, you consider 7.5 milligrams of prednisone a high dosage? That's a great question. So 5 to 7.5 is considered a physiologic dose. That's how much the body normally produces during the day. Nonetheless, it depends on the indication and the duration of treatment. If someone is on 7.5 for weeks, months, or years, they should receive the right patient education kit 
the right sick day and emergency rules, the hydrocortisone injection kit, and a medical alert bracelet that reflects that they're on prednisone therapy. Right, so, so the majority of time, diabetes insipidus may not present with the typical signs of symptoms of thirst or excessive peeing, um, but if not treated, it may lead to significant volume loss or urine loss. Now, humans are smart, they compensate by drinking, but it may reach to a point where they're losing more than what they're taking in, and they may lead to dehydration and ab major abnormalities in the sodium concentration in the body. Major abnormalities in the sodium concentration of the body can lead to multiple neurological issues, including imbalanced thoughts. Yes, one question. Can I ask, if he was, if he was uh, diagnosed like, like 20 years ago with diabetes insipidus, and they did an MRI, um, he doesn't remember, because they probably wouldn't have done that water deprivation testing. He has an endocrinologist. Right, so, so oftentimes in endocrinology and neuro neurological imaging, we look at something called the bright spot. Have you heard of the bright spot before on the pituitary MRI? So there's a bright spot in this area. If preserved, it highly suggests that the individual does not have diabetes insipidus, the bright spot. If lost, it may suggest diabetes insipidus. However, 20, 10 to 20 percent of the population, particularly as they advance in age, have a loss of the, di of the bright spot without any clinical significance. So a bright spot can help rule out diabetes insipidus, but does not fully exclude the possibility of uh, diabetes insipidus. Now the water deprivation test is an extremely difficult test to perform. That's why some individuals, including some endocrinologists, may elect to just treat and see if there's a positive response. And if, the, if there's a positive response, then they, that may be in keeping with diabetes insipidus. Right, which, which, which may suggest that he likely has the diagnosis. But the, the worry is that if someone receives desmopressin, if they have a normal physiology and, and no <coughs> diabetes insipidus, that could lead to major problems. Thank you, Fadi. That was great.